Uh, a couple of things I want to—I <laughs> want you to have a grasp of this day, because we we celebrate as, as we celebrate the Christmas season. We're celebrating the fact that the Lord came, Jesus came as a babe in a manger, and it's wonderful to know that He came as a babe in a manger. However, He's coming again. I get more excited about thinking about the fact that He's coming again. Jesus is coming again. Uh, the Bible says that one day he's going to break the eastern sky and he's going to come riding on a white horse and he's going to, uh, all the earth is going to see him and uh, everybody, e even those who did not know him, even the Jews who pier pierced his side will weep and mourn because they'll look at him who they have pierced <clears throat> and they will rejoice that finally their Messiah has come. And I I'm looking forward to that day. And it, it seems to me that we are here living here on earth right now and we are we are getting glimpses now and then of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the things that he, he has done, the things that he has already, already showed us. Heavenly Father, as we look into your holy written and anointed word today, we thank you for the grace that you put upon us to be able to receive your word. We ask, dear Father, that uh, the words that are spoken today might go deep within us, Lord. Every word that that you have inspired, Lord, that comes to us, Lord, that it go deep in our spirit and it would be planted as a seed and it would grow and produce wonderful, wonderful fruit in the glorious name of Jesus. We thank you, God, that you have given, the, given us the ability to receive the word this morning in Jesus' name. Say this with me. I'm a believer. I believe the word of God. I believe... The Word of God imparts to me the life of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Well, what I want to share with you this morning a bit is about how the Holy Spirit has come, and through different seasons and different times and different dispensations, we'll say, Holy Spirit has come upon us, uh, come, come upon people in different ways. In the, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon people at, at different times as well, but he would come upon people in order, to, in order to fulfill a certain task that God has given them. Holy Spirit would come upon an individual to, to do a, a task that only they could do, that the, the power of God would come a, upon them and they would begin to accomplish a task that God has anointed them to do. And the, the uh, Spirit of God would come and then he would uh, go on to somebody else and uh, he would fulfill a certain task, but there was something about Jesus that was different. When Holy Spirit came upon him, things were different. In John chapter 1, verse 32, uh, the, t talking about Jesus coming out of his baptismal experience, and uh, the God, the, John the Baptist declared, he said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remained upon him. That's a different, uh, a different operation of the Holy Spirit than what took place in the Old Testament. The Bible says there that the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus and it remained upon him. And Jesus seems, it seems to me that Jesus was the first one who came into this world where the Holy Spirit uh, came upon him and remained upon him. Now, we might get confused if we about the Lord Jesus Christ, about who he is, when we, if we were to think that, okay, Holy Spirit, the Bible says, speaks about Jesus being God, and God came in the flesh for you and me, and if Jesus is God, then why would the Holy Spirit have to come upon him? But I want us to remember that Jesus came to this earth, and he lived on this earth for 33 and a half years as a man. He is God, was God, always will be God, but Jesus lived on this earth as a man. And I believe he came and lived as a man so he could show you and I how to live a God-ordained life. He showed, you how, he showed you and I how to operate as a man, as a woman on this earth. And he showed us it could be done. He showed us it could be done. 
Now, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit, of course. And so if Jesus needed the power of the Holy Spirit to live out the kind of life that his Father God had ordained for him, how much more, you and I? How much more and I, you need the Holy Spirit in our lives continually in order to live out the life that God wants us to? Now, in the... Well, in, in verse 33 of John... One, it says, I did not know him. John said, I did not, did not know who the Messiah was, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came, Holy Spirit remained upon him, and John was told that the one that the Holy Spirit remains on him, he's going to be the one who is going to be able to baptize his followers with the Holy Spirit. And so we can be baptized with the Holy Spirit as Jesus was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I thank God for that. If we, if we recognize the uh, oppression or the opposition that you and I have in this life, the opposition that we go through on a daily basis, you might say, well, Pastor, where is the opposition? Well, there's all kinds of opposition that comes against you and I from living God's best life for us. There are demonic forces that array against us and trying to get us caught up in the ways of this world that will rob us from receiving the best of God, the best things that God has for us. Uh, the, the Bible says that God has given us all things that we might enjoy. We might enjoy all things. Well, the enemy, there is an enemy, just as we have a Messiah, just as we have a Savior, just we have a, as we have a loving God, there is a devil who hates us. And if it was up to him, he would, he would kill us just as quick as he could. could. But the very fact that we have, uh, that we are still alive here shows us that we have authority over, over the devil, over the demonic forces. And, uh, but we have this this wonderful advantage of having the power of God living on the inside of us to be able to overcome the things that the enemy uses to try to get us into a place where we look like him. You see, that's what the devil tries to do. He's trying to, he's trying to raise up a people that will look like him. But Jesus has come into the world. He has come into the world and caused us to have the advantage of having the Holy Spirit within us so that we could be like him. Jesus came down from heaven, became man so that we could become like him. That's what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches that you and I are to become like him. And actually in, in 1 John, the Bible says that one day we will see him and we shall be like him because we shall see, see him as he really is. We shall be like him. The more we see of Jesus, the more we come like him. The more we see of Jesus, the more we act like him. And that's why we want to focus on him. That's why we want to, we want to constantly keep our, our spirits attuned to him. Now, as I say, in the, in the past, in the Old Testament, there was people, uh, people had the Holy Spirit come upon them for a specific task. In the book of Judges, we read about Gideon. Gideon was a a prophet of God will say, or a judge, I should say, a judge of the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel were, were in bondage to other nations. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon in uh, Judges chapter 6, verse 34. And, then, uh, and when the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, he was able to lead the nation of Israel into freedom. The Spirit it took the power of God upon a man in order to for him to be a leader so that he could lead the nation of Israel out of bondage. And if you were to read through the book of Judges, you would find that that happened a number, number of times. Another uh, example of the Holy Spirit coming upon individuals at a time, uh, most of us have heard, probably heard about Samson. Samson, of course, was a mighty man of God. He was empowered by God and he had superhuman strength. I mean, he'd be Superman today in a, in a lot of ways. He had superhuman strength. In, in Judges chapter 14, 6, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson, and, uh, because a lion had come against him, a lion had come to destroy him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he tore the lion apart as one would tear apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not, <clears throat> he did not tell his mother and father. 
anyway, uh, the power of God came upon Samson, and he was able to take down a lion, and there's other times that he came against the Philistines, and in one point, the Spirit of God was so powerful upon Samson that he was, he was barricaded in a city, and he wanted to get out, and he, with all his strength, went out at, in the nighttime and took a hold of the gates of the city, picked them right up, the whole gates and all, and carried them off uh, into a mountain. I mean, the Spirit of the Lord can come upon us and do more than what we could ask or think. And of course, in the Old Testament, we see these feats of great strength. But I want us to think about the strength that you and I can have in this realm of the Spirit. I want us to think about the strength that has been granted to you and I to the power to be able to live for Jesus. As a people of God, and I'm talking to a people of God here this morning, our desire is to be like Jesus, to live like Him. And the first thing that we have to understand about a Christian lifestyle is that we can't live it without Him. We cannot live it without the power of God. If you are talking, if you're talking to someone who is, is not a born-again believer, they're not a Christian, and they're living in a way that is not right, they're living contrary to the, uh, the, the Scriptures, they are living a very sinful life, there's no sense in telling them, them to, go, to go and tell them to live right. There's no sense in going to the, telling them, you've got to stop sinning. Because they can't without the power of God. Because the, the Bible teaches us about the Holy Spirit coming upon us and giving us an ability to be able to live for God. Before I was saved, I had uh, some in-laws, and they went to church three times a week. Well, I couldn't believe, I couldn't understand anybody going to church three times a week. I mean, I thought they were nuts. I really did. And I, I thought they were crazy. And, and I, my thought was all the time, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't live like they could. There's no way I could live like that. And that was the truth. I couldn't do it. You, I couldn't do it without the power of God. I can still remember after I got born again, after I came to Christ, after Holy Spirit came upon me and I would be singing in a church, I, I would astound myself sometimes and I think, I can't believe what I'm doing. I'm in a church and singing, singing praises to God and loving it. I couldn't imagine that. But that's what the power of God can do. He can change your life around so that you begin living right and enjoying it. The power of God can do that for us. It's the Holy Spirit coming in and changing our lives completely. Another example we have of, uh, it seems like the Holy Spirit coming upon individuals at different times, it seems like He just kind of pulls the veil back, the veil of this natural life back, giving an ability to be able to see into the things of the Spirit. And so you and I live here, here on this planet, and we enjoy this building that we're in, the chairs that we're sitting on, the sound system and all that, and we think, wow, you know, uh, this, is, this is real. This is not nearly as real as what we cannot see. This is nothing compared to what we cannot see. The, the, the spirit realm is far greater than this natural realm that we live in. And we, we have to realize that you and I as, as spiritual beings on the earth, because that's what we are, we really are spiritual beings, we have a soul and we have a body to live in. It's kind of like we have an, an earth suit. You go to space, you need a space suit. Well, when you live on earth, you need an earth suit. And you and I have been given an earth suit while we're living here. Well, <clears throat> we, the real you and I lives on the inside. You are a spirit being that will live forever. You will live forever. Doesn't matter whether you're saved or not saved, whether you're born again or not, whether you're following God or not, you will live forever. The only difference is where will you live forever? Where will we spend eternity? The choice is ours. God gives us that choice. He gives us that invitation. But once in a while, the, <clears throat> the veil is pulled back where people can see into the supernatural. There was a man in the Bible, actually he was the first murderer, and his name was Stephen. He was a wonderful man of God. He was, he <clears throat> prayed for many people, seen many people healed and delivered and all kinds of things. 
but the religious folk of the day didn't like it. So he was hauled before the Sanhedrin, hauled before the council, and he had to give a, a, uh, a defense to the way he was acting and the, way to, the things that he was saying. And so he began to preach. And as he preached, he spoke to the, his condemners, he spoke to the people who were trying to shut him up. He spoke to them, and they hated him because they were trying to get him out of there, and they wanted to stay in charge. But here, Stephen spoke very clearly, and the Bible says in Acts chapter 6, verse 15, that 6, 15, and all, all the people in the council looking at Stephen when Stephen was talking, all the people looking at him steadfastly saw his face as, had, as it had been the face of an angel. In other words, they were seeing something. The glory of God was on Stephen as he was preaching, and they looked upon him, and they seen him as if he had the face of an angel. Do you know that sometimes God pulls back the veil on some people's lives, and you can see, or somebody might be able to see upon you, the real you on the inside, the real you that lives on the inside? And your face could look like the face of an angel. I remember one time, not long after I got saved, I was going into a bank, and this lady whom uh, I knew, vaguely knew, uh, and she, uh, she asked me eventually if I was a Christian, and I said, yes, actually, I am. I am a Christian. She said, I knew it when I seen you. I could see it on you. Well, what was it that she was seeing? She was seeing something that was originated from the spirit realm. She was seeing something that let her know. She, she, she was a, a Christian, so it connected one with another. Well, sometimes God will pull back a veil in order to get our attention. And when Stephen was preaching there, he pulled back the veil and allowing his accusers to see that he actually, his face looked like an angel. And they were all listening to him. Uh, they, were, they were caught up in what he was saying because the power of God was upon him. And he got right down to the very end of his preach, preaching and uh, he really... He didn't mince any words. He called them a bunch of stiff-necked people who would not listen to the Word of God. And the Bible then says that they, all, they were all enraged, and then suddenly the, the, the veil was pulled back for Stephen, and he looked up and he said in, in verse 55, and Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadily, steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Well, the religious leaders of that day were enraged because they thought here was a man saying that they could see Jesus standing at the, at the right hand of God. Now, these religious leaders, they hated Jesus too. They thought he was a fraud. But suddenly, Stephen was able to see Jesus standing at the right hand of God and what did those religious leaders do? The Bible says that they picked up stones and they stoned them to death. He was the first Christian martyr. Now, that will give you an idea of how the enemy and the things of this world wants to come against the things of Christianity, the things of, of Jesus. The enemy is putting, trying to put in the hearts of individuals to get you to, to say things well, the enemy is, is trying to get each one of us to live in a way that is contrary to the things of God so that Jesus might be discredited. But that's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit so that we might live right and be able to represent the Lord Jesus Christ properly. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it without the Holy Spirit. And when you come to, if you, if you were considering even the things that, that Kevin spoke about this morning about coming to Jesus, if you were considering that, and if your idea is, yeah, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better, that doesn't work. Doing better doesn't make it work. Doing better doesn't get the job done. The only way we can get the job done is coming to Christ and asking him to come into our lives and change us, come into our lives and cause us to what to be what the Bible says, being born again. Doing better doesn't cut it. We could be the best person on earth, 
without Christ and still die and go to hell. We need Jesus. So God can pull back the veil so that we might see that there is a supernatural realm. And things are happening in the supernatural realm. Things are happening in the spiritual realm all the time. I believe, right, I believe, with all my heart, I believe that there are angels in this place right now, in this building. Why? Because the Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him. Well, there's a bunch of people here that fear God. So if the Bible is true, the angel of the Lord camps around those who fear him, so the angel of the Lord is here. There's angels in this place today, and they do what they can in order to influence us for the kingdom of God, to live right before God. Angels are going to and, to and fro, and they're, they're doing what they do in order to help you hear and listen to the truth, because angelic forces have to be dispatched in order to keep the forces of darkness back, because the forces of darkness would like to come and confuse your mind so that you can't hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But the angels come, and they do what they do in order to keep these forces, put, in this, put them in their place so that you can hear the Word of God unhindered and embrace the things of the Spirit. I'm so glad for the angelic forces. I'm so glad that we have forces that is out of this world to help us while we live in this world. Glory to God. Now, even in, in uh, Jesus' birth, when <clears throat> in, in Luke chapter 1, it says, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, this virgin's name was Mary. And of course, we know this, this, this story. Then at verse 31, it says, and be, the angel telling Mary now, behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So here the angel told Mary that she was going to get pregnant. And she said, How am I going to get pregnant? I don't know, man. I, I, how, am I, how is there going to be a child born in my womb, and I have not known a man? And then, of course, the angel said, the highest, the, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Everybody say overshadow. Overshadow you. Therefore, that one that is conceived in you will be called the Son of God. So what happened to Mary? What happened to Mary when the angel said that? Well, the Bible said the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her and overshadow her, but there was something had to be, a seed had to be planted in Mary's womb in order for a baby to be born. And that's what the Holy Spirit did. He planted a seed in Mary that, that, that seed was to gestate and is supposed to be, you know, go through a period of time, and that seed would eventually produce a baby. Well... The seed that was planted in her would be eventually be the savior of this world. Now, what is that seed? Think about this for a moment. The seed that was planted in her womb, it eventually grew and produced the savior of the world. Now, that seed was actually something that we call the word of God. The Word of God. Actually, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him and through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. He says the Word was with God. Well, over there in Luke chapter, chapter 8, when the disciples are discussing to uh, discussing with Jesus about the parable of the sower, Jesus said in Luke 8, 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. So what was impregnated into Mary was a seed, and that seed was the word of God. 
that Word of God go and in her and produce. Now, the Word of God that comes to you and I also comes to us as a seed. Whenever you are here, a word, a, a word of revelation, it comes to you as a seed. When I was, when the Holy Spirit was convicting me, he was speaking to me, he was calling me out of darkness into light, there was the word that was being impregnated into my spirit so that the word began to produce. And when that word reached its full gestation, something happened. I was born again. I gave my life to Christ. I became born again. The word is what caused me to be born again. I found out that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Romans chapter 10. I found out that that word was in there. You see, as Holy Spirit was convicting me, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I, I was a heathen. I, I really didn't know anything about the Bible at all. But I, I was brought up in a Catholic uh, faith, so I knew there was a heaven and there was a hell. I knew I had heard about that, but I had left that thought years ago. But as Holy Spirit started coming, drawing me closer to him, started drawing me. He reminded me of those things. And as a Catholic, I knew there was a hell, and I knew I was on the road to hell. I knew I, that's where I was headed if I kept on this track. And so when I, when I found that out, I decided, ah, that's not someplace I wanted to go. And the fear of God came upon me. And so I kept reading, and I found out that there was a way to get off this path. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I found out that if I gave my life to Christ, if I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, if I asked him to forgive me from all my sins, that I could get off that road to hell and get on that road to heaven. And I thank God I, I took it. I thank God. That the day that I knelt by my bed and I said, God, I don't know if you're real. I don't know if this is what, uh, what I'm reading about. I don't know if it's real. But if you're real, God, come in and save me. I don't want to die and go to hell. And something happened. Something took place in my life that changed me. I went to bed that night. I slept well. I didn't have any lightning bolt or anything like that. But when I get up the next morning, something shifted. Something changed. I had a thirst for the Word of God. And, and I loved to, to read about the Word of God. And you might say, you know, <clears throat> for, a born, for somebody who is not saved, you might say, well, that sounds pretty boring. You know, you, you, you enjoy reading the Bible. That, you know, I'm used to drinking and doing drugs and all this kind of thing and partying kind of stuff. You know, reading the Bible? How boring is that? Well, it's only boring to the unsaved. It's not boring to the believer. It's not boring to the child of God who knows that they're reading about what eternity is going to bring them into. When they find out that they don't have to die, don't have to go to hell, you can be really happy. Because most of the world are living in fear because of what's on the other side. But every born-again believer can know what's on the other side. They know that no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more depression, no more oppression. No more mixed bag of everything. I mean, over on the other side, there is rejoicing, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter, uh, I might say it wrong, so I'll just got to quote the verse. Uh, it talks about the fact that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what you and I have to look forward to if we're born again by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let me read this scripture real quick in 1 Peter uh, 1, 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. So that incorruptible Word is a seed. Now, I want you to think about this really carefully. The Word is a seed. And you may have heard 
some of the things that I'm preaching about and that we uh, had this wonderful invitation from the Lord Jesus Christ to become born again. And you know the prayer. You said the prayer. You know the prayer says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So you confess with your mouth and the Lord Jesus, and now you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, but nothing happened. It seemed like nothing happened. It seemed like, you know, there's lots of people like that. Well, I said the words, but nothing happened. Well, I want you to know that when you confess that, there is a seed planted within you. And a seed doesn't produce overnight. A seed comes, and it needs to be germinated before it will produce the fruit that you're looking for. Whenever we have a revelation, what I mean by a revelation, you know, we, we read a word and suddenly uh, we don't only, only read that we realize that we need to be saved. Suddenly, suddenly there is a knowing on the inside of us. You see, the only way that we can know that we know that we know that we are saved and born again is through revelation. But when the seed is planted to us, that revelation, it just comes as a seed. And whatever we do with that seed will determine its effect on, upon our lives. We can take a seed, somebody can give you a bag of seed in the spring of the year, where you, want, you, you ask for seed for the plant your garden and so forth, and somebody can give you all the seeds that you need. And you're so appreciative, I've got the seed, I've got the seed to plant, and you shove that in your cupboard, and then you go about living your daily lives. The seed is available, but you haven't did anything with it. You haven't planted it into the soil of the earth. And that word of God sometimes takes a while to be planted into the soil of our spirit. But if we are sincere when we come to Christ and ask him to save us, that seed will go into our spirits. And it, if we don't pull it out, it'll stay there and it will produce an abundant life. It will produce the life that God has for you. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. We receive that as his word, and that word needs to be germinated. It needs a time to, to produce before we'll see the manifestation of that. So don't get discouraged. When, we come to, when we're praying about a certain thing or when we're reading, we're reading something in the Scripture and we don't see that evident in our lives, don't be... Be patient. Let me put, that, put it that way. The Bible says that we are through, are to, through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. We need to take time for that seed to germinate. Now, with the power, the power of the Holy Spirit can come upon us. It can happen slow or it can, can happen fast. But with the power of the Holy Spirit on us, it can come in a major way. Now, <clears throat> well, I'm going to have to cut off a whole bunch of this, but... I want us to remember that the Word of God comes to us as a seed, as a seed. So when we give our lives to Christ, that Word of God comes as a seed. It's not automatically producing everything we want right away, but it'll grow. As we care for that seed, we protect that seed, we honor that seed, we water that seed with the Word of God, it'll grow. The Apostle Paul said, one sows, another reaps, but God gives the increase. So God is the one who will cause it to grow. Now, we read about how the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and it overshadowed her. It overshadowed Mary and she was impregnated by the Word of God. Now, I want to read a, a scripture in the book of Acts. Here we have a great demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowing a vessel. In the book of Acts, there was, all, obviously there was all kinds of people healed by the power of God. And the, the power of God would come upon individuals in order to release healing in many cases. And the Bible says that through the apostles, there was many signs and wonders that came, came forth. And in Acts chapter 5, we read about Peter, the Apostle Peter, that he was, uh, he was moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the anointing of God was upon Peter. And the Bible says in verse 15, so he was so anointed that, 
they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on them, on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were healed. Now when the Holy Spirit, when the shadow of Peter would fall upon the individuals, the Bible says that it would fall upon them, that same word that was used to overshadow Mary to get her pregnant, that exact same word here is used here when the Holy Spirit overshadowed the sick and brought healing to them. The power of the Holy Spirit overshadowed the sick and brought healing upon them. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for that overshadowing. I I'm, I'm want to see the, overshadow, the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit come to the body of Christ. Come in such a measure that we've never seen it before. Look, it happened in the book of Acts. It happened back there amongst real men and women, and the overshadowing actually brought healing to many, many people who were sick, brought deliverance to many, many people who were sick. And if it did it that back then, he can do it today. And I believe as God's people yield to the power of the Holy Spirit, then we will one day see the power of God manifested in such a measure that the world is going to take notice that we've been with Jesus, that the power of God has come upon us, and that it is, the power of God is available to them too to come into the kingdom of God. Have we allowed the Holy Spirit to overshadow us? to plant the seed of life on the inside of us. This is the thing that we have to ask ourselves this morning. I don't know uh, if there's anybody here this morning that you've never asked Christ into your life you've n and, and been overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Uh, there, there could be a lot more than what I think. I don't know. But you have an invitation by the Holy Spirit today to invite the King of kings and the Lord of lords to come into your life and shift you and change you. And you might say, well, Pastor Bill, I did that years ago, but I'm not experiencing this joy-fulfilled life. I'll tell you one thing. It's not God's fault. I'll say this. It's not, it's not God's fault that you're not experiencing the things that he has for you. Why do I say it's not his fault? Because Jesus Christ went to the cross and he was beaten to the point where they could not recognize that he was even a man. And he did that for you and me and he paid the price so that you, can, uh, you and I could have the abundant life that Jesus came to bring us. It's available to us if we'll enter in and receive it his way. The power of God is real, folks. He's overshadowed Mary. He's overshadowed the people who were sick. And there's many other cases we could go to in the Bible where the power of the Holy Spirit came upon the people in order to bring deliverance to them. And if you were born again this morning, you have already received the greatest miracle that you could possibly receive. Because the power of God has come upon you and delivered you from darkness unto light. You see, we're going to see in the days ahead a greater demonstration between the supernatural and the natural. I believe we're in a day and age today where the darkness is getting darker, but the light is getting brighter. And bright light always dispels darkness. And it's simply what side are we going to run with? Which side of this veil are we going to run with? Run to the light. It is the light that will set us free. It is the light where we'll find the glory of God. It is the light where we'll find our needs met as he overshadows you and I.